Okay, welcome back after the break. Uh, just before we went for our break, we were looking at uh, First Timothy uh, chapter 1, verses 5 to 7. We're talking about uh, legalism, Jewish legalistic rituals that they were bringing into the church. And we were also talking about a few uh, uh, legalistic laws or rituals that is practiced in our churches in today's time. Anyone wants to add to what I said? Anything that you feel is uh, binding on people is just like a legalistic law or ritual that is binding on people in your churches that you've observed or in, in other churches? Anyone likes to share? Uh, well, uh, I know we talked about this um, in your class last term, last semester, um, though I still think it's in a way legalistic. Uh, when you make it compulsory for women to cover their hair before they can uh, do any activity in the church, you know, be it reading the Bible, singing, uh, I, I, to me, in as much as I would respect churches that do that, I still find it that is legalistic because there's a tendency for women in those churches to feel that they're only accepted by God and holy before him once they cover their hair. But if they really understood that this was just a cultural thing in that context that Paul talked about, I think it would have made a lot of difference, you know, not making it composure. That's why some of those churches, many of the young people are leaving. So you only find the older people um, in such churches because they still hold on to those, to that ideal way of um, how a woman is supposed to appear in church, you know, if they're going to conduct any um, of the activities laid out in the service. So I, I, I think that is legalistic from my own point of view, but at the same time, like you taught us, uh, I would respect any church that tries to uphold that, but I think that is legalistic practice. Yes, thank you, Say. Thank you so much. Anyone else like to share? Yes, Christopher. Yeah, I, I think uh, in uh, in some uh, denomination churches uh, there are uh, there are some rules and regulations which are imposed uh, where um, for example uh, when a when a person who's attending church service uh, before they uh, they need to uh, come to church or before they receive uh, the, the communion they need to they need to not eat for all you know uh, not have anything to eat before you know, for, for about one hour before um so I, I i think that i'm not sure that i don't think that is something that is i think that's very legalistic um i think related to that also is that uh, there is also this uh legal aspect of having uh, gone, gone, uh, you know, going through some kind of a repentance uh, in a formal way, and I'm talking about denominational churches where you have to go and you know actually confess your sins before you can receive Holy Communion. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, they want to basically impose this on the people, saying that you know you need to repent, you need to sort of be clean, to be clean, and you know, and you then can can receive the Holy Communion. So I think that's also another legalistic uh, practice that is, uh, that is, uh, that is, you know, occurring in churches. Thank you, Christopher. Uh, so we'll move on. Verse 6, uh, Paul says, for some have uh, having strayed have turned aside to idle talk. So uh, the idle talk, if you look at it in the King James uh, version, is translated as vain gangling. Uh, the, so the idea here is just meaningless babbling, you know. Uh, so when you just meaninglessly chatter and babble or talk, you know, it, it has entertainment value. And that is why, uh, you know, many of them are interested in these false doctrines, is in this endless genealogies. And, uh, 
you know Jewish fables because it's like uh, it's uh, it's it's just meaningless babble, but it has entertainment value. Uh, but it's it was never meant uh, for spiritual food. It does not uh, edify the person's faith or strengthen them uh, in their uh, faith. Verse seven, he says, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they uh, affirm. So the the problem with these uh, uh, people who are uh, you know talking about or the Gnostics or uh, the Jewish uh, uh, people uh, who come to the faith uh, who are spreading all these Jewish fables and endless genealogies, uh, you know, um, they desire to, to teach the law. Uh, but you know the problem is that they don't even understand uh, the implications of their own uh, teaching. They don't even understand what they're saying, or they don't even understand the implications of their own uh, uh, teaching. So uh, this is another way that we can know, which is uh, you know, uh, uh, if somebody is speaking the right doctrine uh, or you know, uh, or a false doctrine, is is they will not even understand. You know, it'll just be so philosophical, but uh, they will never come to a, 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 a to a point where it 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 brings about the truth. There has an end to it. Uh, it ties up things together, but it will just leave everything in loose end, and it just leaves people uh, wondering and wandering and uh, imagining things uh, because there are people who are talking all these. Um, uh, you know, philosophies, new age philosophies, and all of these things, they don't even understand uh, uh, the thing. They, they're trying to un try to uh, they're trying to find out the truth they're trying to reach a conclusion but they're not able to do it uh, 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 themselves okay so verses 8 to 11 uh, we'll move on to verses 8 to 11 can somebody please read verses 8 to 11 please anyone yes asha now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their forth, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murders, the sexually immoral man, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers and whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been interested. Thank you, Asha. So here we see Paul is stating that the law of God is good uh, because it, the main uh, intention of the law is to keep us from doing what is wrong. Uh, but he says, but we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully so the purpose of the law is to show us our sin uh, uh, it wasn't made for the righteous person uh, who walks by faith uh, but for the lawless and the insubordinate uh, because they are not uh, you know um, uh, uh, because they're living in sin, uh, to show them that they are living in sin, uh, to open their eyes uh, to the sinfulness that they have fallen in, and to bring them to a place where they can uh, walk by faith uh, and receive the salvation that is in uh, Jesus Christ. So the idea isn't that the law has nothing to say to uh, uh, the righteous person. Uh, it has uh, things to say to the righteous person, but it especially speaks to the ungodly, to the sinner. Uh, it shows them that, uh, you know, it shows them their sin, it shows them that they have fallen and uh, they need a savior, that they need salvation and they need uh, deliverance. And then Paul says, for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for uh, sinners. So in Paul's mind, the sound doctrine uh, and right conduct are uh, kind of, you know, connected, vitally connected to each other. Uh, so saying if you have sound doctrine, then you would live uh, a, a life that is honorable, holy, pleasing, uh, a righteous life. But if you live, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, believing in this false and in the lies and in the wrong doctrine, it just shows in your conduct. Uh, so uh, he's in Paul's mind. He's you know uh, he's he's basically connecting sound doctrine and right conduct, and he says these two are widely uh, connected. So the sinful actions uh, here, which he describes or he enlists in verses nine 
9 and 10 are contrary to sound doctrine. So he's saying because uh, you are all, you know, preaching and teaching and enjoying and listening to these false doctrines, uh, that is why you see amongst yourself you know, all of these uh, kind of people who are there and he lists out the sins uh, that is uh, prevalent or evident at the churches uh, at um, Ephesus. So, you know, um, and he's saying that if there is a, any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, so the implication is that in Ephesus, uh, the church, you know, basically existed in a culture which was which had these sins, these sins were very prevalent, uh, uh, or the culture of uh, uh, the Ephesus church, their culture was marked by these sins, which he lists out in verses 9 and 10. And he says, those teaching false doctrines uh, in some way have allowed or even promoted this sinful uh, lifestyle. So another way for us to know if uh, somebody is teaching the right doctrine is again, uh, you know, going back to uh, to seeing the fruits. Uh, one of the fruits we said is, you know, there will be uh, strife, division, disorder, discord, uh, confusion. The second thing we said, the third thing is that you will see a lifestyle uh, with all of these uh, sinful habits and sinful uh, behavior. So anything that says uh, that these sins are okay is contrary to sound doctrine. So one way we know that uh, what is the if the preacher or teacher or a certain a group or certain church is preaching a certain kind of doctrine, if they're saying these kind of sins are okay, you know, uh, it's okay for you to uh, uh, to any uh, to uh, to get to be in adultery or homosexuality or or whatever. Uh, they say Paul is saying this is contrary to sound doctrine. This is not the right doctrine, and this is uh, the evident conduct that we will see uh, because um, sound doctrine and right conduct are uh, you know connected um, to each other. So if anything that says or anyone that says that these sins are okay, it's contrary to sound doctrine, and is also contrary to the gospel or the glorious gospel in Christ Jesus. So while we are aware that we must stay away from all of these sins, uh, you know, just like to bring your attention to verse 10, um, where it talks about sexually immoral. Uh, it's basically, if you look at the English Standard Version, it talks, it, it for this word sexually immoral, uh, it's mentioned as those who practice homosexuality. So any kind of teaching that says that sexual immorality or homosexuality is okay, uh, is contrary to sound doctrine and is also contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ, the glorious gospel that is in uh, Jesus Christ. So according, Paul says, according to the go glorious gospel of the blessed God. Okay, he, he, uh, he mentions this in um, verse 11, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed uh, to my trust. So though the law cannot uh, bring about righteousness, it just makes people aware of their sin, but cannot bring them in right standing uh, with God because they fall short of keeping the law, they break the law. But Paul is saying the glorious gospel of the blessed God, that is the gospel uh, 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 that in, in other words, Paul is saying that was committed to his trust, this gospel uh, can, uh, you know, uh, uh, can bring you to a place of righteousness. It brings you to a right standing with God, uh, a right, uh, a right uh, conduct with God, uh, 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 to live righteous and holy lives in Christ uh, Jesus. So we see here that you know uh, Paul sends his responsibility uh, to preserve and guard this gospel, and he is passing it on to uh, Timothy and others, and he's saying, uh, you know, if you have to you know, stay in this place, uh, uh, it's uh, one of the main things you have to do is you need to guard uh, this gospel because this gospel was entrusted to me, it's entrusted to you, uh, it's our responsibility, we have to preserve this sound doctrine. Uh, so he says, you know, um, do not leave Ephesus. Uh, he says, uh, uh, like he he says in in uh, remain in Ephesus in uh, in verse three. So one of the reasons he's giving here is you know present the right doctrine, teach the truth uh, in totality, uh, so that you know um, 
uh, teach the glorious gospel of the blessed God uh, so that it can bring about uh, you know a right conduct and uh, you know right standing uh, with God and his uh, Paul is telling you know I've been entrusted with this gospel I uh, have lived to preserve it and guard it and he's passing it on uh, to Timothy and to uh, others any questions so far any questions on these verses Okay, if there are no questions, then um, can somebody please read verses 12 to 17, please? First Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 to 17. Can one of you please read? Uh, someone else? Asha has been reading all the time. Anyone else can read? Shall I read now? Yes, thank you, Stavani. <laughs> Verse 12, and I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I didn't, did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. However, for this reason I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Now to King Eternal, Immortal, Invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Stavani. So here in these verses, verses 12 to 17, Paul is reflecting on his own life and uh, his calling. And through this, he's encouraging uh, Timothy and giving him a reason why he needs to remain in Ephesus. And Paul say, begins this uh, small segment by saying, and I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me. So Paul uh, was entrusted with the gospel uh, uh, and uh, you know Jesus has enabled Paul uh, and entrusted him with this gospel. And Paul is thanking Jesus uh, for enabling him and entrusting him with this gospel. So Paul was enabled for the ministry uh, uh, because uh, not just because he was a Jew, not because he was zealous for the law, uh, not because he was uh, you know zealous in keeping the law, uh, you know, and persecuting all those who are not. But he's saying that you know uh, he will, God, uh, Jesus Christ enabled him and entrusted him with the gospel because he counted him faithful for the ministry so what uh, uh, paul is encouraging uh, timothy is saying be faithful you know uh, faithfulness is what made paul ready to be used by god and uh, he's telling timothy uh, remain in ephesus uh, be faithful to the call that god has given to you the the call that he has entrusted to you the gospel that he is um, entrusted to you in verse 12 he says counted me faithful putting me into the uh, ministry. So, uh, you know, basically what we learn from here is we don't have to be smart to be faithful. You know, uh, we don't have to be uh, uh, super talented or gifted to be faithful. Uh, some uh, Faithfulness is something that is very down to earth. Uh, and each of us can, uh, you know, be faithful. And God is looking for faithfulness and for us to continue to remain faithful uh, in the place that he has uh, called us for. So what God is looking for is not for, uh, you know, um, wisdom about his word, how much we know, how much we can quote scripture. Yes, it is important that we know his word. Uh, we correctly divide and rightly teach his word. Uh, you know, it's not, uh, he's not looking for, uh, you know, super talented or gifted people who are multitask, who can do various things. But what he's looking at is, uh, you know, even if we have a something, uh, uh, you know, a, a gift that we look at as small, you know, uh, are we faithful? 
uh, are we faithful in uh, in the salvation that we have received that we are uh, faithfully you know sharing it to people are we faithful in uh, what we have received uh, the word of god are we faithful in just teaching it imparting it and sharing it with other people uh, maybe we are talented and gifted in whatever area, whether it's worship or uh, the instruments that we play or uh, writing. Are we using it uh, for the extension of his kingdom is what he's looking and he's looking for uh, faithfulness. So sometimes we think, you know, uh, 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 we have to be smart in our minds. We have to be. Uh, we need to uh, know all of Scripture from you know from Genesis to Revelation, all of the doctrines, and uh, you know we need to be. Uh, uh, we need to enhance or build on our talents and gifts and our skill sets. Yes, we need to do all of these things. All of these are important. Uh, it's very important for us to build on what God has given to us. We need to be good stewards. But at the same time, you know, if you're doing it uh, with ulterior motives, not with a clear conscience, like Paul mentions, uh, you know, um, and not being faithful what he has given to us, then, uh, you know, we cannot, uh, we are not good kingdom builders. We cannot continue to build God's kingdom. But what God is looking is for faithfulness in spite of all the difficulties, in spite of all the challenges, in spite of all the... Uh, weaknesses that we and the inabilities and incompetence that um, we face and we think we have uh, you know that is why uh, the word of God says you know we are not competent enough to be ministers but God has made us competent not of the letter that kills but the spirit that gives uh, life so we don't feel competent but God has made us competent he will make continue to make us competent all he looks for is uh, faithfulness if you are faithful you know he gives us uh, uh, he enhances our skills our talents uh, so that uh, we can extend god's kingdom in a powerful way verse 13 he says although i was formerly a blasphemer a persecutor and an insolent man but i obtained mercy because i did it ignorantly uh, in unbelief so um, you know um, Paul is basically talking about his former life uh, you know how he uh, persecuted the Christians how he blasphemed the name of uh, Jesus uh, the work uh, uh, what Jesus did on the cross, what he completed. Uh, he was a very rude man, uh, you know, and he says, but in spite of all that, he obtained mercy uh, because he did that ignorantly and in unbelief. So he says, although I was formerly, you know, Paul's past, uh, 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 his past life, uh, his lifestyle, the way he did things did not disqualify him from serving uh, uh god but because of god's mercy and his grace uh, which were more was more than enough more than sufficient to cover his past and enable him to serve god um, in that present situation in that present moment and the rest of his uh, life so in the same way you know we should never feel that uh, you know whatever our is our past you know whatever has been our past um you know, not live in that past, but, you know, even as we have um, accepted uh, uh, our, uh, our falls, we have asked for forgiveness of sins, we've received salvation, you know, uh, God does not look at our past. He's always looking at our present and our future and for us to fulfill what he has purposed for us even before the foundation of the world, uh, you know, um, I never feel that uh, your past, uh, uh, you know, uh, even though it brings back memories, uh, is uh, it, it will be unable for you to be used by uh, God. But for God, your past is covered, you know, it's for forgiven, it's dealt with, it's done away with, you know, uh, and he's just looking at you as a new creation, uh, uh, somebody who is in right standing with Jesus Christ, um, uh, something who, who has been made righteous and uh, he is uh, enabling you or he's giving you uh, the grace and the strength and the mercy uh, uh, to be used mightily by him. So it's important for us uh, not to look back at the past, but to look ahead at what God has for us. And that's why Paul says, you know, uh, um, forgetting what all that is in the past i look forward and i run ahead uh, to the goal to the price that uh, uh, christ jesus has set before 
uh, me. So with these words, uh, Paul is giving uh, Timothy another reason to remain in Ephesus. Uh, it's likely that, you know, one reason Timothy wanted to leave Ephesus uh, uh, and this ministry there was because he felt unworthy. He felt incapable of the work because he was a very young man, 37, 38 years old. Uh, there were many leaders in the church who were much older to him. Uh, and he felt that, uh, you know, he was very young, incompetent, incapable, unworthy to do these words, uh, the, the ministry there. So these words from Paul, you know, basically assures Timothy is if there is anyone unworthy and disqualified, Paul is saying that is me. You know, uh, uh, if there's anyone unworthy and disqualified uh, to uh, share the gospel, to build the kingdom of God, uh, it's me. But yet, you know, God found a way to use me. And the same way he's using me, he will use you. So he's saying, you know, uh, remain in Ephesus. So just basically encouraging uh, Timothy from his own life and his own uh, experience. And then he says, because I did it ignorantly uh, in unbelief. So, you know, Paul, um, when he persecuted the Christians, when he was a blasphemer of, uh, of the gospel of Jesus Christ, you know, he did that in unbelief. He was not a believer. Uh, but having said that, you know, ignorance and unbelief never excuses our sin. Sin is sin in God's sight. Uh, we can never uh, uh, make ignorance and unbelief as an excuse. But ig our ignorance and our unbelief, you know, invite God's mercy. It invites God's mercy into our lives because this, because sin and ignorance and unbelief, you know, it basically makes one less guilty than the believer who knows uh, and sins uh, knowingly. So, you know, uh, even though uh, if you were an, when you were an unbeliever, you sinned in your ignorance and unbelief, it uh, uh, it does not excuse your sin, but it basically invites you uh, uh, to God's mercy. Why doesn't why why do I say it does not excuse your sin? Because uh, we we looked at it in uh, studied it in Romans chapter one. It says, you know, you have your conscience. God has given us uh, uh, inner voice and inner gospel. That is the conscience for those who do not have the law. Who do not know God? So how do how are the uh, uh, the Greeks or the Gentiles um, judge? Is through their conscience, uh, 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 and any given uh, you know law that God has placed in their heart, which tells them what is right and uh, wrong. So we can't excuse our sin, uh, uh, but it just uh, basically opens up. Uh, or invites us to God's mercy. And when we receive God's mercy, you know, uh, we receive his grace and we come to a right standing with him. Uh, we are made righteous in his sight. Verse 14. <clears throat> Sorry. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant. So uh, it was not Paul's uh, ignorance that saved him, but it was the exceeding abundant grace of God. It was God's unmerited favor. So, so for all of us, you know, it was uh, the unmerited favor. It's the grace of God. That's why we receive salvation by faith, uh, by grace through faith. And it is through the abundant grace of God. So God is very lavish. Uh, in his grace, in his kindness, in his goodness, in his mercy towards us, no matter what we have done. And uh, Paul is testifying to this and he's telling Timothy, you know, um, uh, you know, be faithful uh, to what God has entrusted, to what you've called, the gospel that he's given to you. And also, you know, um, don't feel unworthy, don't feel incapable for the work. Look at me, you know, when God can use me, um, uh, uh, his grace, his strength, his mercy is also made available uh, uh, to you. And you can uh, continue the work and finish what God has taken you to do or entrusted to you, uh, even as you are overseeing the churches at um, Ephesus. And then verse 15, uh, you know, Paul summarizes his personal experience of the gospel. So can uh, one of you read, please? Uh, can you please read verse 15, please, one of you? Anyone can read verse 15? Yeah. Can I read verse 15? Yes. Yes. Yeah. 
This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Thank you, Abhishek. So Paul is writing and saying this is a faithful uh, saying and worthy of all acceptance. Uh, you know, this, this unusual phrase uh, basically introduces a statement of uh, something that is of uh, utmost importance or special importance. And Paul uses this uh, phrase in his other pastoral episodes. We read this phrase five times that he's used in his other pastoral uh, episodes. He says, you know, um, Christ Jesus um, came into the world to save of whom I am a uh, chief. So Paul claims uh, to be the chief of sinners. Uh, it is not just an expression of, uh, you know, just humility that he has, some kind of false humility, but he genuinely felt, uh, you know, that the sins that he had committed made him more accountable before God than uh, others. So he must have had this, this great burden of what he had done to uh, the Christians, how he thrown them into prison. Of course, you know, people that he had thrown into prison, uh, he had, who he had got them uh, killed, uh, he can't bring them back to life. There's no way that in, uh, now as a believer that he can um, get them out of prison because he's not with uh, that group. He's no longer with them and he himself is, you know, um, being persecuted so he must have felt this huge burden of uh, you know what he had done in the past and so he he says he's a chief of sinners it's not just an expression of uh, you know, to show himself as a very humble person or uh, just ex showing some kind of false humility but he genuinely felt his sins made him more accountable before God uh, than others. So it's, it's, it's really amazing that even after all of these years of, uh, you know, great ministry, that apostolic ministry that Paul had done, uh, he just focuses on one thing that, you know, um, Jesus Christ came uh, to save us sinners and uh, he uh, of whom he called of all the people you know whom Jesus Christ came to save he calls himself as the chief of um, sinners uh, verse 16 and 17 uh, yes Susan you can read verses 16 and 17 please yes ma'am Hobbit for this cause I obtain mercy that in me First, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern of pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Susan. So what Paul is mentioning here in verse 16 and 17 is saying the way that he has received salvation is saved by grace, the mercy of God. He's saying this is a pattern of mercy to others. So what Paul is saying is I am talking about this. Uh, or I keep sharing about this is because, you know, when people hear it, uh, they will also um, be aware of their sins and they will be aware of the mercy of God and that mercy of God that just saved me and brought me into salvation, you know, would save them. And when they in turn uh, share how they had sinned, how they had fallen and how they had received the mercy of God. They share it to others. You know, others will hear and also will receive salvation. So he's saying that it be, will become a pattern. So Paul was saved and his salvation uh, uh, served as a per pattern of mercy to others so that others can also receive uh, uh, salvation. And he says, however, for this reason, I obtained mercy. A man as bad as Paul you knows has obtained mercy. It means that um, Paul is saying, when I can receive that mercy, you know, if the door is open to others who are not as bad as sinners or those who has, you know, those who have committed, you know, crimes like I have done. Uh, you know, the mercy of God is freely available to them. So even if people are in the in the stage where I am, you know, sinful life that I am, you know, the mercy of God can still save them. Uh, can still come to their um, to their rescue. So you know, some of us are um, uh, praying for our loved ones. Some of us are grieved uh, over the lifestyle of our uh, of our family members, our loved ones, those who are very close, dear to us, our friends. Um, 
you know one way we could uh, you know we could share the love of Christ with them is just to share how uh, share your own sins how you had fallen how uh, uh, you know the depth of sin that you were in or uh, the, the misery that you were in the pain the brokenness the uh, the, uh, the affliction and the oppression that you were in and how God delivered you and restored you and uh, you know his mercy and grace and his love how it just reached down you know just sharing that itself is going to set a pattern where they would uh, you know see themselves uh, uh, as sometimes you know people who have fallen in deep sin see themselves as not even worthy of God uh, to receive his love they're far from God's love far from his mercy and goodness that God will not accept them because human beings you know they're seeing people are not able to accept them and how can God accept me but when you share your own uh, uh, life experience your life story your salvation experience you know uh, it will just uh, lead them to uh, uh, the salvation uh, uh, also to put their trust in God um, maybe if it's not just salvation you know uh, you went through a major crisis in life after you received Jesus Christ you know or uh, some struggle some challenge um, something that you face and how God delivered you how miraculously they de delivered you provide you can just provide details it just in itself you know um, reveals the goodness the love the mercy of God and I'm sure you know uh, even as you're sharing the Holy Spirit it will minister will speak to their hearts and can uh, you know change them and they can receive salvation they can come uh, into uh, uh, the mercy and the grace of uh, God so he says that you know as a pattern to those who are going to believe in him uh, this explains another reason why God loves to save sinners uh, is um, uh, you know not the main reason but one of the uh, minus reasons so that becomes a pattern to those who are going to believe on him and God wants others to see what he can do by his work in our lives through his grace favor unmerited favor and his love in our uh, life so what God did in Paul's life is an example a pattern of his abundant grace uh, and great patience to encourage us uh, Paul breaks out into you know just praising God he says now to the king eternal immortal invisible to God who alone is wise the honor and glory forever and ever amen so Paul is praising uh, God who saved him he says now to the king eternal you know uh, Paul could not think of how bad he was and how great but he, uh, you know but he just looks ahead of uh, looks at how great the salvation of God was and how great the love of God was towards him his mercy his goodness towards him um, and he's saying that you know I can't just keep quiet without just breaking out into spontaneous um, uh, praise so uh, this this verse here verse 17 is an outburst of his praise that shows uh, that Paul both knew God uh, uh, you know and that he loved God so it just it's just showing us that you know from where he has come from darkness into light you know just praising uh, God and uh, he, it also shows us that uh, you know he knew God and he also loved God in such an intimate and in a very personal uh, way so he knew God to be the king eternal uh, the one who's ruling reigning and in complete power and glory he knew God to be immortal which means um, existing before anything else existed and the one who created all things who brought everything into uh, existence uh, he knew God to be invisible uh, you know um, somebody who completely knows us every little thing every little thought every little tear every little uh, desperation every little frustration uh, every little thing that we go through big and small he knows everything um, uh, you know we can't completely figure out God we cannot understand him comprehend him know all of his revelations and secrets um, uh, because he's invisible he's great is infinite but uh, it's wonderful to know uh, that this God who's infinite knows me completely through and through 
uh, in and out. He sees every detail of my life. He knows everything. Uh, he also, Paul also knew that God alone is wise, that he is God. Uh, and that we are not. He does things in his ways. We cannot comprehend and understand. Um, uh, you know, sometimes we think our plans and insights are so important, but only God really knows and understands uh, all things. And then he, you know, uh, he's, he's praising God, giving him the glory and honor forever and ever. So he's saying, knowing all about God, or knowing all about, uh, or knowing all this about God, that He is the King Eternal, that He's immortal, that He's invisible, and who alone is wise. Knowing all this about God, Paul couldn't just stop uh, praising Him. Um, uh, you know, sometimes we have trouble worshiping God. Uh, it's you know, it's not because we can't worship God. It's we have this trouble of worshiping God. It's because we don't know Him very well. You know, uh, we just don't know His attributes. We don't know His nature, or uh, we are not in such deep intimacy, or we are not just in that place where we are meeting with Him and fellowshipping with him and knowing him you know in a real deep in a personal way and that is why sometimes uh, we have uh, trouble worshiping god and we are under we're trying to understand how can i really worship god in spirit and truth is because uh, we are not in that place of total surrender total intimacy total love with god and his word spending time with him is uh, that's the reason why we have trouble worshiping um God. So this whole description that he gives of knowing God and who God is, he's uh, sharing it with Timothy uh, 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 as another reason for him to remain in Ephesus. He's saying that um, that you know he should stay there uh, because you know uh, even as he's staying in Ephesus, continue to remain there, continue to remain there by looking and considering or focusing his eyes on the greatness of God whom he uh, serves. Because this great God, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, can empower him, uh, can help him and can enable him and sustain him even as he ministers there at uh, Ephesus. We'll move on to verses 18 to 20. So can somebody read uh, verses 18 to 20, please? Verses 18 to 20. Okay, read Asha. This I charge, I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith among whom are Hymenius and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to be blasphemy. Thank you, Asha. So in um, verse 18, Paul uses the same word, charge. Uh, this charge I entrust to you or I commit to you commit to you is the same charge uh, the uh, which I mentioned uh, which is written in um, 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 3 and I said and I mentioned to you that in the ancient Greek this word for charge uh, you know is a military word uh, referring to an order from a commanding officer that has to be obeyed there's no two ways about it there's no alternatives but it's an order and has to be obeyed and then Paul is saying you know I charge you uh, but then he's using strong language here, uh, you know. Um, uh, uh, but and then he's also, you know, coming to a very uh, 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 a close uh, uh, relationship, and he's reminding uh, Timothy that even as I charge you, you know, uh, uh, or giving you this order, but I'm giving you this order uh, not as someone who is uh, an apostle or your leader, but uh, you know, as a father telling uh, the son 
Okay, and I'm 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 giving you this order in love because you are my son. He says, Timothy, my child, and um, you know, and he says, according to the prophecy. So Paul wanted uh, Timothy to consider, you know, what the Holy Spirit had uh, said to him or spoken over his life uh, in the past. Uh, through the prophecies or through the uh, the words spoken over his life to various uh, people, so he's reminding him, "Hey, remember all of these prophecies that have been spoken to you uh, by the Holy Spirit through people, you know, um, you know, uh, so that you can receive courage and encouragement and remain in Ephesus." Uh, uh, from those prophecies, from the words that were spoken to you about your ministry, about your life, and how God wants to uh, use you. So apparently, God had spoken to Timothy through others, uh, through the gift of prophecy, and the words uh, were an encouragement for Timothy uh, to stay strong in the difficult uh, situations. Uh, you know, uh, uh, it 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 may have been a description of Timothy's uh, future. The prophecies may have been a description of Timothy. Uh, future ministry uh, it can uh, the prophecies could also have been warning against being timid in his work for God uh, but whatever the prophecies were you know um, God wanted Timothy to draw strength uh, from what was spoken to him uh, over his life uh, through the Holy Spirit uh, in this present difficult situation or position uh, or responsibility that he uh, has. So he says, make use of those prophecies that are spoken over your life. Use them to fight the good fight and uh, use them in the spiritual warfare against the enemy. So he's reminding him that it's not a physical battle. It's not fighting against people, but it's a spiritual battle, a spiritual warfare. And he's saying, speak these prophecies against uh, the enemy that is coming against you, uh, even as you wage warfare, even as you fight the good uh, fight. And Paul refers uh, to these prophecies again later on in his letter in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14, and 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. And we uh, read it uh, uh, um, last monday when uh, sister avini asked us a question on this and then paul says that by them you may wage the good warfare so the focus here is not just on the prophetic word uh, that timothy heard in the past but uh, to focus on the battle that is right in front of him now uh, where he must wage the good warfare that he must you know the kjv version says uh, you fight the good fight and he says do this uh, with uh, you know what the holy spirit has spoken over your uh, life so that it can be uh, uh, encouragement you know you have the boldness and the uh, strength so Timothy had this huge responsibility, this uh, this uh, ministry in front of him, the job that is in front of him. It was, you know, like as if he was going into battle. Um, it wasn't Paul is telling him it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be comfortable. Uh, it's not going to be uh, a carefree time. Uh, but he had to approach the job uh, that Paul left him to do in Ephesus as a soldier, you know, uh, approaches battle. As a, when a soldier approaches battle, all the time he's thinking about uh, the enemy strategies, how to overcome the enemy, how to fight the battle, uh, and how to, you know, win the uh, battle. So uh, this gives Timothy uh, another reason to remain in Ephesus, that he should sense the responsibility to stay on um, even when he feels like leaving because uh, he was a soldier in battle and a soldier in battle uh, never deserts his post uh, the position that he is in he fights to the very end and in verse 19 you know paul gives him the tools um, for the warfare he says the two tools he gives for the warfare that uh, that timothy is in now is faith and good conscience faith and a good conscience so he says having faith and a good conscience which some have rejected concerning the faith have uh, have sh uh, suffered a shipwreck so faith and a good conscience uh, these are two essential things when we uh, we are battling or we are in a spiritual battle in the warfare uh, they protect us um, from the spiritual attacks of doubt and uh, condemnation so timothy had to have faith uh, that god is in control that god uh, is good he's merciful 
he would guide Timothy, uh, even as Timothy continued to seek him. And then a good conscience is simply living right before God and man. Uh, if you do away with good conscience, uh, do things that uh, your conscience says is wrong, then you know it will shipwreck your own faith and destroy uh, your own faith. Uh, and he gives examples of, of that. Uh, you know, um, uh, so he's telling um, uh, Timothy that you know you have to have a good conscience because uh, his enemies would be attacking him. And if Timothy had not conducted himself rightly, they would have a good reason to attack him. So a good conscience uh, isn't just a conscience that approves us, but also one that approves us because we have done what is right uh, and is conduct and is con connected with uh, good conduct. Okay, we'll finish uh, these last few verses. We've come to the end of. Um, our time here. Uh, we'll continue these last few verses and then move on to First Timothy chapter two uh, in the next class. Anyone has any questions so far? Any questions? Okay, there's no questions and we'll end class. Thank you all for your patience uh, in going through these three hours of lectures. And uh, uh, please read up second, uh, First Timothy chapter 2 so that we can begin with that uh, next week, even as we come, you know, just do the concluding uh, verses in First Timothy chapter 1. Uh, have a good and blessed day and a blessed week ahead. And uh, I will see you for uh, this course next Monday. Thank you.